Hello, everybody. I, thank you for coming <laughs> so early in the morning. And my papers uh, are titled The Uncanny Valley Hypothesis and in Animated Documentaries. The Uncanny Valley Hypothesis of the Japanese specialist in robotics Masahiro Mori has recently been in the spotlight of animation studies. Animation usually tries to avoid the effects of the uncanny valley, for example, in the production of the well known films Wally uh, by Andrew Stanton and Up by Pete, the Doctor and Bob Peterson. The Uncanny Valley was a subject of open discussions and the authors of both films looked for solutions which would enable them to avoid it. Animated documentaries on many occasions tend towards the uncanny regardless of, of their purpose. Some of them attempt to represent objectively significant and dramatic events. Others deal with personal, usually traumatic, experiences of such events or with purely personal drama. There are also animated biographies, educational or scientifically orientated films. Sometimes animated documentaries try to extract something singular and essential from the dull, mundane reality. There are also attempts to combine reality, imagination, and dream in an animated stream of consciousness, a reality that many of us would recognize to be similar to our subjective inner worlds. All these films often border on the uncanny valley or even cross that invisible border. It is this border that I would like to explore in several films. But first, let me begin with a summary of the theory of the Uncanny Valley, its origins and its connection to animation. The term Uncanny Valley was first coined by Dr. Mori in uh, 1970. According to him, people would react emotionally better to a robot whose design breaks away from lifeless, purely geometric forms and is more similar to humanoid forms, even though stylized. But if this similarity increases to a greater extent, uh, a zone can be reached where the robot's design invokes negative human reactions. Dr. Morris' hypothesis has found a wide response amongst cyber specialists, cognitive scientists, software programmers, psychologists, neurologists, evolutionary scientists, and designers. Besides, it has gained large popularity in the world of arts, among writers, artists, filmmakers, and especially animation directors. Even before the release of Wally and Dop, various scientists, designers, and artists had already suggested a few design principles which would find wider application in the years to come, especially in the CG animation. Some of these principles, interestingly, uh, mainly based on caricature and exaggeration, seem to be as old as animation itself and were formulated by different pioneers of animation. Dr. Morris and Canny Valley, although deriving exclusively exclusively from Dr. Yanch's work on the psychology of the uncanny, which was written in 1906, can be traced back to much older times. We can find anticipations of its existence in the Hellenic world, in ancient China, in medieval Japan. As a whole, the birth and the evolution of android robots has inevitably been associated with observations of human reactions towards them. Even before I got acquainted with the criticism of Dr. Morris' hypothesis, I wondered why his theory had not taken into account some important factors. 
I think that every culture, civilization, and generation would react to androids in a different way. Of course, at the time when it was formulated, nobody could foresee how quickly generations would change their perception. Globalization was in its early stages, and the global network did not exist. One of the main critics of Dr. Morris' theories, David Hansen, a renowned and rather eccentric American robotics designer responsible for the creation of a series of realistic humanoid robots. When one reads his criticism, it sounds quite logical, but when one looks at some of his eccentric creations, especially at the robot copy of his girlfriend, one seems to understand what Dr. Murray had meant with his uncanny valley hypothesis. Maybe another critic of Dr. Mori, the American psychiatrist and writer Irvin Yalom, is more accurate in his suggestion that it is mainly people belonging to the three Abrahamic religions who would feel uncomfortable in the Uncanny Valley, because their beliefs have taught them to feel like God's ultimate creations. Perhaps Dr. Mori, as a Buddhist, does not mind seeing opposite himself, another empty vessel filled with content. We can all feel that the uncanny valley somehow exists. It is difficult to answer how each social group responds to it, whether it causes disgust, antipathy, fear, or just simple curiosity. However, I'm convinced that there is such an area, not only in cyber design, but in any human activity, including animation, which creates counterparts, simulacra, replicas, or copies. Dr. Morris and Canny Valley is a place that most of us do not feel comfortable in. M many people have been in this valley long before its godfather, Dr. Jens Tiench, gave it its name following in the steps of the famous writer, artist and musician, Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffmann. This mysterious place, fascinating and frightening at the same time, have been visited by numerous authors and artists, Mary Shelley, Hans Christian Andersen, Edgar Allan Poe, the French sculptress Madame Tussauds. They were all children of both the age of reason and romanticism two consecutive and overlapping periods which are inextricably bound up with the concept of the uncanny. Later on, the same phenomenon occupied the minds of Karel Czapek, Isaac Isimov, and many others, including the most outstanding figures of psychology and psychoanalysis. The essay of Dr. Jens <coughs> grabbed the atta attention of Dr. Freud, who wrote in response his essay, The Uncanny, focusing on the more scary aspects of it. Instead of the fear of androids, he introduces another, more important factor for the <coughs> existence of the uncanny than the android. Some of these factors are subjects of main concern for his colleagues Otto Rank, the doppelganger and Carl Jung, synchronization, etc. Uh, Dr. Mori also is conscious of the fear uh, of androids, but he focuses rather on the intellectual uncertainty examined by Dr. Jens. Moreover, being a Buddha follower, he envisages a far away and yet invisible point of perfection where the sub cyber design will be so ideal that robots will be loved by people and the Frankenstein complex will be overcome. Maybe he has in mind the moments when robots will be able to love people too. Why do I associate the Uncanny Valley with some animated documentaries? It's because some authors, maybe following their instincts, often choose for such films the most realistic style, computer-generated or rotoscoped animation, thus indicating that the story is real. As an animator myself, I have had some problems with a lot of films where 
CG animation, rotoscoping, or the so-called digital actors have been used, regardless of their genre, style, or dramaturgy. I have always found slightly disturbing those characters that disclose the animator's efforts to make them look real. Sometimes the character's eyes are strangely evasive, reminding us of a secretive, furtive partner in a conversation. If the character is the bad guy, a zombie, a terminator, an extraterrestrial, etc., we are more inclined to put up with the queer eyes problem. But when the character is supposed to be attractive, the shifty eyes can be repulsive. Everyone who is acquainted with the history of animation has heard about the problems animators had with the rotoscoped characters of Snow White and the prince in the Disney version um, from 1939, especially in comparison with the cartoony dwarfs. I believe that rotoscoping or stop motion have recently become rather trendy, mainly for the grotesque looks and movements of the make-believe alive characters. They usually have some vague defects, either shifty eyes or speed and weight that would look all right with real living creatures, but in their two-dimensional you know, replicas produce a bizarre effect. The shifty eyes have become a distinguishing quality of the characters in two films that I perceive as animated documentaries, Waking Life by Richard Linklater and Waltz with Bashir by Ari Foman. Of course, Waking Life is far from the prevailing concept of a documentary, but I believe that such personal diaries have their place within the genre's wide boundaries. Moreover, the film is much more than a diary. It is something like a film stream of consciousness which abandons the pretense of objectivity and attempts to include the observer into the observed world. I fully understand that the shifty eyes problem might be more irritable for an, for an animator than for someone uh, that is not professionally involved. Well, watching it on TV for the first time, I was intrigued by the beautifully written text and by the topical theme of interwoven realities. At the same time, I was irritated by the shifty eyes effect, probably because I am an animator. By the time the film finished, I had become aware that this effect was employed here on purpose to create the feeling for intermingling, evasive, indistinct, almost quantum realities. The film Walsh with Bashir manages to overcome the shifty eyes problem with the strong dramaturgy based on real historical events with its well-written dialogues and monologues and its honest first-person narrative bare of any ornaments. The significance of the subject matter goes beyond the specific context of the Middle East conflict and focuses on the eternal recurrence of hatred imposed on us by historical, political, and economic circumstances. On our incapacity to overcome it sometimes, on the roles we all play in our lives, one way or the other, the roles of victims and executioners. The shifty eyes effect is purpose purposefully employed here as the plot follows the attempts of a former Israeli soldier in Lebanon to uncover the accommodating layers of forgetfulness and to get to the truth about his experiences during the Israel <coughs> Israeli assault on Lebanon. Human eyes perform many movements that do not irritate anyone in real life. But when they are traced, however accurately, by a pencil, brush, or digital pen, the result is that, <coughs> that effect of displacement, known to all who have sat at the lie box as animators or in-betweeners. When traced drawing by drawing, the images move with every new copy wobbling in a random and uncontrollable way. The smaller the detail, the more inaccurately it is traced. No matter how stylized the rotoscope movement is, there is always a risk to lose the credibility and integrity of the original image. 
but sometimes this is the director's intention. Another film in which the presence of the Uncanny Valley is fully justified is the film Ryan, directed by Chris Landreth. Here the author apparently plays with the effects of the uncanny with, uh, and with the intellectual uncertainty <coughs> studied by psychoanalysis. The film is dedicated to the talented Canadian author Ryan Larkin, who in his films easily crossed the borders between animation and documentary filmmaking. The life of this author is tragically linked to the hazardous features of the hippie culture, drugs, alcohol, and consciousness expanding substances that lead to a mixture of memories, objective observations, imaginations, <coughs> imagination, dreams, and hallucinations. I've always considered the film Walking, uh, 1968, to be an animated documentary, even though it is not normally defined as such. In this film, the observation of the outside, uh, outside world is so concentrated that it goes far beyond the subjective perceptions. If documentaries are an attempt to objectively, objectively observe the outside world, this film is more documentary than the ones that present subjectively real people and events. In street musicians, Ryan Larkin uses live action shots. But however illogical it may sound, the film Walking, in my opinion, functions more like a documentary than street musicians. But let me go back to the film Ryan by Chris Landreth, which is a conversation with Ryan. Instead of live shots of Ryan, we see his computer animated body, parts of which are stripped to the bones, while others fall apart to become animated elements. Here the boundary between the inner self of Ryan and his, and his external body is visualized. And amazingly, his bare arteries are not perceived as naturalistic. The whole character is truly convincing. He is the real Ryan. On the other hand, this hovering over the edge of the uncanny valley shocks, touches, and moves us just like the personal tragedy of Larkin does. Chico and Grito <coughs> uh, is an animated feature-length film directed by, by Fernando Troeba and Javier Mariscal. Here the main story is fiction, but it is staged against the non-fiction background of Havana, New York, Hollywood, and Paris in the 1940s. The secondary characters here are real figures from the Golden Bebop era. era. The backgrounds are designed after a meticulous research under, undertaken by the authors. They managed to find the rich Cuban archive of photographs of Havana from the 40s and 50s. And they also used photographs of American party goers on planes flying to Havana or Cuban musicians who flew in the opposite direction, and of course, of the great jazz legends of America, who also add up to the true life atmosphere of the film. The film's score is beautiful, especially for those who love jazz. It is written by the Cuban pianist, band leader, and composer, Bebo Valdez. Strangely, it is the soundtrack that makes the film a documentary, in spite of the invented main character's love affair, which is so typical of the mainstream live action cinema. Although elegantly paying tribute to the comics book styles of the, uh, style of the age, Marisco's design presents a difficult task for the animators. The director of the film is fully aware of the challenge. He says in an interview, that the film's crew had been looking for the right balance for almost six months before production started. The result is decent animation, but not as vivid and compelling as it is in another animated film with true life motives, The Illusionist. It is related to the Uncanny Valley, not through its animation and design. Uh, here, we, here we must mention the famous magician Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, besides his numerous machines and his house in Blois, 
where various monsters and dragons peep out of his windows, he left several texts, one of which devoted to the notorious chess plating automaton, the Turk. This story is related with two films. One is the silent film of Raymond Bernard, the chess player, from 1927, and the other is the animated feature, The Illusionist, by the famous French animator, Sylvain Chaumet. Here the story is about the strange friendship between an aging traveling magician and a girl who believes in his tricks as if they were Christmas miracles. Some see as the prototype of the illusionist uh, Robert Houdin. The script is by the famous French comedian Jacques Tati, which had been sent to Chaumet by his daughter Sophie Tatiche, even before his film Trio of Belleville came out. She did not believe that any living actor could play the part of her, of her father, and that is why she chose the talented French animator to complete the task. The script does have some allusions of Houdin, and there are also some strong autobiograph autobiographical elements. Delicately employed to create the film's backdrop, the, magic, the magical power of three-dimensional computer animation here is not intrusive. Numerous hand-animated uh, episodic characters fill up the railway stations, compartments, pubs and streets of London and Edinburgh. All the hard work put in, into the animation, as well as in the relatively realistic background, serves one purpose to create a compelling atmosphere that surrounds us like a mysterious fog. There aren't so many gags, metamorphoses, or any other, any other animation tricks. There are hardly any close-ups. Some scenes are frankly descriptive and scrupulously circumstantial, as life sometimes is. But in the character design, we can again recognize the caricature, grotesque details that alienate us from realism, though here they are deliberately subtler than in Chaumet's other masterpiece, The Triplets of Belleville. Chaumet himself explains that the film is about a father-daughter relationship, hinting at his own family drama, as well as Jacques Petit's personal story. But the, det <coughs> the details here are not so important. What matters is the obstinacy of the girl in her refusal to believe that the sorcerer is just an old liar. This is a story that takes us to the miraculous realm of animation and reminds us of the golden era of automata, filled with romantic longing for the beautiful illusion with the escape from here and now. Animation is itself imagination and illusion, but I do believe, however pathetic uh, this may sound, that imagination and illusion are sometimes the best shortcut to, to the truth. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, it's a bit, uh, this first slide is a bit twisted. It's probably from the transfer from Mac to PC. But um, my presentation today is called um, Animated Recollection and Spectatorial Experience in Walls of Bashir. It's, um, it's basically, um, dis it's distilled from a lengthier version of, 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 of it, which was co-authored with my colleague Roy Bendor from Simon uh, Fraser University um, in Vancouver. And it will be published this fall in the special issue of animation, uh, an interdisciplinary journal that will be devoted to animated documentaries. Um, so throughout the presentation, I will um, refer to what we or we do or argue and not myself. Um, and um, I will probably not show any clips, but I will have uh, several images. So I'm assuming that you've all seen the film. <clears throat> Was with Bashir, Ari Folman's animated war memoir, opens with a pack of 26 ferocious dogs storming the streets of Tel Aviv at night in search of revenge. A literal dramatization of a recurring nightmare experienced by Boaz Rhine, one of Ari Folman's closest friend, the scene shows these hounds of hell forcing their way from an unknown point of origin, 
disturbing the serenity of a typical urban street in Israel, onto their imminent destination, the apartment where Boaz now sleeps. It establishes right from the onset the basic thematic contradictions that epitomize Foreman's film, the unresolved tension between dream and reality, the absurdly short distance between sanity and psychosis, and the need to bridge cinematically between what must be shown and what cannot be represented. It also, however, introduces the viewer to a formal strategy which is largely unfamiliar within the language of the animated documentary, lushly animated in clashing shades of cobalt and orange and accompanied with a meticulous audio landscape comprised of 102 different sound channels, which also include wolves, lions, and tigers, the opening sequence creates an unmooring audiovisual spectacle that assaults the audience senses, shakes them out of their comfort zone, and immediately immerses them in the film's world. It is no wonder, then, that the film was received with both amazement and horror, awards and admonishment. When it comes to animated documentary films, <clears throat> such spe spectatorial responses are not trivial. This is because the animated documentary is locked into, this, into a, a tenuous relation with the world it represents, a relation expressed in the mixing of realistic themes with fantastic forms. In what follows, we will argue that the strong spectatorial responses Bashir evokes are in fact inseparable from the film's method of interrogating reality, the film's cognitive and embodied effects, product of its unique aesthetic strategies, are essential for its disclosure of reality in all its complexity, ambiguity, and multifacetedness. We will argue that Bashir synthetically produces a rich, consistent, and thus trustworthy sense of reality for its viewer, not despite, but because of its aesthetic choices, its innovative animation techniques, and mixing of reality with fantasy. Accordingly, we're interested in weaving together analysis of the film's content, content and form with accounts of their reception, combining a discussion of how the film evokes certain somatic responses with individuals with a consideration of the political significance these responses may carry. In a key conversation that takes place early in the film, Foreman's friend and collaborator, psychologist Ori Sivan, helps him understand the entanglement of reality and fantasy that girds our memory. Sivan says, quote, memory is fascinating. Take this famous psychological experiment. A group of people were shown 10 various childhood photos. Nine were really taken from their childhood, depicting real experiences that actually took place, but one picture was fake. Their portrait was pasted into a picture of a fairground they never visited. 80% recognized themselves in the picture, identifying the fake photo as real. The other 20% that couldn't remember themselves in the fake picture went home and then returned to the researchers and said, now we remember. They remembered a completely fabricated experience. Memory is dynamic, Sivan says. It's alive. Even if some details are missing, these black holes are filled by our memory until there is a fuller remembrance of something that never happened. Unquote. Our memory indeed includes events and experiences that took place factually and events and experiences that did not. Together, the real and the imagined, the actual and the fantastic construct the fabric of memory, or what we will call here the nemic contexture. Importantly, both forms of memory are inseparable from our experience of reality, are inhabiting what phenomenologists call world or the life world the background structure that allows entities, relations, and identities to become meaningful. The life world makes experience intelligible, but at the same time remain intangible. In this sense, the world of actual experience is never reducible to the empirically validated objective world. Martin Heidegger calls that which lends itself to empirical validation factual or ontic, and that which does not factical or existential ontological. Heidegger's distinction is quite useful for expressing the epistemological status of nemic components without recourse to terminology that poses the difference between real and imagined, sometimes understood as objective and subjective, as ontological hierarchy. In this vein, and by using Heidegger's terminology, 
We argue that Bashir's depiction of dynamic contexture includes both factual memories that can be empirically, ideally, or in practice verified, <clears throat> and factical memories that remain beyond empirical verification. While referring to reality in different ways, they are both equally important parts of the way the film's protagonists, burdened by traumatic events, inhabit and remember the life world. That is, the way they experience reality and retrieve its nemic traces. <clears throat> Sivan, Sivan's explanation of the organic and processual nature of memory is emphasized visually by the imposition of the experiment's fairgrounds Ferris wheel and hot air balloon on the landscape behind Fulman as he listens to Sivan's words in the next scene. In a visual scenic doc, <clears throat> the factual and the factical are already mixing. The mixing itself is not an indicator of delusion, but a natural part of nemic retrieval. This movement between factual and factical memory is the quintessential marker of a process of remembering. In this sense, Walsh with Bashir is as much about memory itself as it is about the retrieval of specific memories. As a meditation on memory, Bashir straddles the boundaries between past and present, dream and reality, recollection and hallucination. In some scenes, the factual and the factical coexist and intermingle, giving visual representation to the way they are entangled in dynamic contexture. In other scenes, the movement between the factual and the factical is foregrounded and expressed through a series of seamless and dissonant transitions. In both cases, <clears throat> The relation, sorry. In both cases, the relation between the factual and the factical is marked aesthetically by the creative use of different styles of animation, different color schemes, sound, and music. These, at times, provide the only clues to the ontological nature of the events depicted, factual or factical. The most obvious marker of temporality and factuality is Fulman's use of color where different color schemes and filters indicate different temporal locations. Images from World War II in blue, images from the 1973 Yom Kippur War in washed out brown, etc. Foreman's conversations with friends, along with different segments of the Talking Heads interviews, obey a conventional documentary format and use realistic color schemes. They are sketched in a more realistic and straightforward way, placing the camera in standard mostly frontal positions, and remain relatively faithful to the original setting. On the other hand, scenes whose content is more factical than factual are characterized by an overly aestheticized spectacle-like quality, sketched with extremely contrasted colors, spatial disproportions, slow movement, and three-dimensional inserts. In this respect, the dog scene that opens the film sets the standard with its stark orange-gray chromatic filter. Carmi's recollection of the sea voyage to the war zone follows suit with a dreamy blue filter. In the film's recurring motivator scene in which a young foreman and two other soldiers float at night in the flare-lit sea opposite Beirut, open their eyes, rise up naked from the water and walk toward the, sh the shore in a zombie-like manner, the color scheme provides the only indicator of the transition from the factical to the factual. While the viewer may not be aware of this transition, despite the color change, the first time the scene appears, the eighth minute, by the time the sequence reappears in full, 60th minute, color provides the clue to solving the conundrum that drives Fulman's search of time lost. As the group of soldiers rise from the waters, and navigate their way from the beach through the narrow street of Beirut, the film shifts from the orange-gray scheme that, that indicates facticity to a monochromatic gray that indicates factuality. <clears throat> sound, however, <clears throat> sound, however, is also used to create nemic puzzles and ambiguities, undermining the seemingly evident differentiation of fact from fiction. Interestingly, this function goes beyond sound's more traditional role in the film, to furnish it with indexicality, mostly in the interview scene, and to lend a, scene, a sense of legitimacy, corporeality, and three-dimensionality to the documented subject. 
In the scene in which Foreman arrives at Beirut's international airport, just after the Lebanese president-elect Bashir Jumayel has been assassinated, Foreman's voiceover simultaneously discloses and conceals the way his memory of the situation is saturated with factical elements. At first, we see him disembarking the military helicopter amidst park civilian airplanes and bustling military activity. In voiceover, he describes how the overwhelming excitement is in seeing civilian airplanes amidst the war zone triggered an hallucinatory fantasy. Walking through the empty terminal, he admires the luxurious duty-free stores, taking in their cosmopolitan air. Then, the voiceover tells us, he suddenly realizes that all the shops were abandoned and looted, and that even the notice board for arrivals and departures was completely frozen. As the hallucination is blasted open to reveal the reality whose existence it denied, Fulman is pulled out of his daydream and thrown back again into the harsh reality of war. As we see one tail section of a civilian airliner loosely attached to a completely bombarded fuselage, the slippage between the factual and the factical becomes apparent. The park civilian airplanes that populated the establishing shot were never really there, at least not in the state foreman's voiceover and corresponding animation described them. The sequence's voiceover may have disclosed the shift from the factual to the factical, but it also concealed the true depth of their entanglement. Only when we see the airplane's tail along with its shattered body, we're able to retroactively invest the establishing shot with its proper ontological value. Interestingly enough, the image of the bombarded plane was drawn based on an iconic picture from the first Lebanon war, as you can see in this image, how closely they look alike. Keen-eyed viewers may be able to spot Foreman's trickery even before the sequence spells it out for them. But this iconic image complicates things even further. Can Foreman's personal recollection of a traumatic moment be separated from the collective national memory of those events? The series of juxtapositions, transitions, and dissonances we describe above do more than facilitate the textual movement between the factical and the factual, the two dimensions whose mutual articulation is crucial to the film's depiction of dynamic contexture. Dissonant juxtapositions, whether by montage or by the co-presence of residual elements, trigger visceral embodied responses in the viewer. This has become evident from viewer accounts of their spectatorial experience. In an article published in the Daily Haaretz in Israel, six months after the release of the film in the country, war veterans from the First Lebanon War attested to the degree to which watching Bashir had created experiential resonances with their own memories of the war. Here are just two examples among many. Near Melamed, who was only 19 years old during the war, confessed to experiencing strong flashbacks from the war while watching the movie 25 years later. And I quote, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't watch an animation film, but a completely realistic movie, my own movie. It was done from my own point of view, made exactly according to the way I have seen the war. I saw the same roads, the same beach, the same orchards which I crossed in Lebanon. The film connected me in a very tangible and powerful way to my memory, unquote. Nathan Baruch, who was a military reserve during the war, describes a similar physical reaction. Quote, my experience of watching the film was not normal. My body was shaking, but I couldn't stop. I felt a sense of belonging to the characters in the film, as if 26 years have not passed, as if the war just happened yesterday. I felt that I was participating in the film, and then, I suddenly felt I was choking. My heart was beating faster. I was out of air. The film brought me back to what I was doing there. I was carried away." Unquote. Upon reading these accounts by veteran, several questions emerge. Is it the content of the common memories represented in the film that is responsible for the strong somatic responses these viewers report? Or rather, is it the particular form of the mnemonic representations that elicits and amplifies the effective intensities with which viewers encounter Bashir. 
would any cinematic depictions of an RPG shot at soldiers or a bullet hitting a tank commander elicit the same visceral response from viewers? Similar questions motivate phenomenological accounts of cinema. From, an, from a phenomenological perspective, filmic texts are inseparable from the way they are experienced by an active embodied spectator who is both the historical product and the site of certain practices, techniques, institutions, and procedure of subjectification. Of course, every viewer is located in a particular social and cultural environment, and every filmic text is viewed in a particular setting, both of which influence singular viewing experiences. Nonetheless, the strength of phenomenological approaches lies precisely in their capacity to extract the more universal traits of a viewing experience from the contingent features of singular viewing experiences. While the relation between the senses the human sensorium is prone to continuous cultural and technical recalibration, vision itself can, ne can never be completely severed from an embodied viewer. Thus, Vivian Sobchak understands the embodied cinematic spectator as, quote, a synesthetic subject, unquote, characterized by its ability to preconsciously translate seeing to touching and vice versa. Describing her own sensual experience, watching the scene where Baines reaches out and touches Ada's flesh through a hole in her black woolen stocking in The Piano, the film by Jane Campion from 1993, Sobchak argues that synesthetic subjects are able, quote, to experience the movie as both here and there, rather than clearly locating the site of cinematic experience as on screen or off screen, unquote. Her diagnosis thus unfolds a complex dynamic by which the viewer responding to events on the screen is able, quote, both to sense and to be sensible, to be both the subject and the object of tactile desire, unquote. This duality not only frames cinematic spectatorship in explicitly embodied terms, focusing the theoretic gaze on cinematic materiality and texture, but also calls attention to the way such metaphysical categories as subject and object, inner and outer, I and the world, lose their definitional purity in the act of cinematic experience. The way synesthetic subjects experience filmic text is not exclusive to live action cinema. Writing about animated cartoons, Joanna Boldin argues that despite the lack of verisimilitude between animated and real, natural flesh and blood bodies, to which the cartoon viewer is well aware, there still exists an, an essential link between animated and real bodies, a certain resonance between the animated body with its impossible physicality and the viewer's own body. In this sense, cartoon viewers experience a kind of supplemental materiality that allows them to experience their bodies in augmented, hyper-real ways. In fact, she argues, it is precisely because of this lack of immediate indexicality of the animated image, in virtue of its physical law-defying materiality, that animated bodies offer viewers amusing, exhilarating, and potentially radical embodied experiences. Insofar as the animated film can be understood as, to use an Umberto Eco uh, term, lazy machine that requires viewers to do some of its work, the extended degree of cognitive filling in demanded by the animated film includes a visceral preconscious process of comparison between the viewer's body and the animated one. Cartoon viewers thus experience the animated body vicariously as a form of access that may potentiate transgressive material meaning making. The synesthetic subject, therefore, can be understood as a continuous dynamic process of sensorial simulation, translation, and assimilation that straddles the factual and the factical. This is the case in the scene where Foreman receives a detailed demonstration from Frankel on how to use patchouli-scented oil, whose scent has remained incredibly vivid in Foreman's memory years after the war, and now functions as a sensorial stimuli for nemic recovery. The meticulous movements of Frankel's hands as he rubs the oil on his skin, along with the sound of him sniffing his body afterwards, address the viewer's senses and entices them to simulate both smell and touch. This is also the case when we are invited to experience a bullet trajectory as it hits the neck of a tank commander 
amidst the, the pastoral Lebanese scenery. We may lack direct experiences of projectile movement, yet this does not result in a disembodied response, but in the opposite. As attested by another veteran, quote, at that moment I immediately felt as if the bullet hit me. I felt anxious and terrified, unquote. The outcome of this diegetic spillover is an uncanny, uncanny, intense, and explicitly embodied feeling of being there, despite the lack of realistic verisimilitude. As such, Bashir asserts the value of visual experience over visual representation, and thus challenges the mainstream subordination of the image's capacity to produce sensuousness and effective resonances to its indexical fidelity. The movement between factual and factical memories, between surreal and brutal imagery and sound, creates effective visceral responses with the viewer. These, these in turn trigger mnemic responses for those who, like Fulman, have experienced the war but could not or would not remember it. But even for those who have never witnessed war firsthand, they provide lightning flashes of shock that challenge, destabilize, and ultimately shatter distanci distanciating effects that may be associated with the film's animated form. This is nowhere more evident than in the film's last sequence. 80 seconds of live action footage that established the film's final act of remembering. Fulman and a fellow soldier stand at their post outside the Palestinian refugee camps following the massacre, where they face a tidal wave of, wa of wailing Palestinian women pouring out of the camps. After the camera zooms in on Fulman's face, and keeps him in a close-up for 10 seconds or so, we cut to a reverse shot made of real live footage of the same women whose voice we heard superimposed on the animation. The shift to live action functions as the ultimate act of awakening, hitting the viewer with immediate force, like, to use a Benjaminian term, an instrument of ballistics, Despite the sound serving as a bridge between animation and live action, the film's only use of location sound with animated images, the transition is sharp and startling. In a sense, the transition from animation to live action is facilitated and to some extent mitigated by the lengthy shot of Fulman's face in close-up. Breathing heavily, eyes jittering, lips parting gently, his anxiety is palpable watching him absorb and reflect the sights and sounds of the women's anguish prepares the viewer unknowingly for the transition to live action. Given the time to internalize Fulman's anxiety, we end up feeling it too, even before the next live action shot arrives. Nevertheless, we cannot help but feel shocked when the reverse shot re reveals the Palestinian women in live action footage. This is an unexpected denouement, a final chord providing the spectator with an eye-opening, rude awakening. Any layer of shielding distanciation that may have persisted due to the animated form's beauty and melding of the factual and the factical is peeled off to disclose the naked, visible evidence. Foreman's use of well-recognizable footage, well-recognizable footage of the massacre, of the hours after the massacre, as is his use of iconic image the iconic image of the bombarded airplane in Beirut's airport, links his personal process of recollection to collective memories of the war. In a particular sense, the spectator's somatic response to the film mirrors Fulman's own experiences. As Fulman lets his senses guide him from amnesia to awakening, so do we, the viewers, thus making Fulman's nemic journey very much our own. Thus, despite Fulman's insistence, that the film is predominantly a personal account of subjectively mediated events, it inevitably retrieves entities, images, and situations that modulate collective memory and identity. Bashir can be understood as a form of nemic ritual. Our embodied engagement with the filmic text constitutes an active participation in the war's collective perception. By viewing the film, we perform its recollection inflected by our individual mental and somatic dispositions. This is how the sensorial experiential link between filmic on screen 
and spectatorial flesh and blood, flesh and, and, and blood bodies we discussed above may become the nexus for political engagement. Bashir channels the somatic responses it produces into powerful moral statements about the brutality, absurdity, and ultimately the futility of war. In this sense, the film's representation and rendering of the first Lebanon war as a mnemonic object does not rest on its provision of new factual or forensic evidence, or alternatively, on its making explicit Folman's personal responsibility for the events. Folman's and our own collective moral responsibility for the heinous acts in Sabra and Shatila is not intellectualized, but experienced. As explained by a viewer that served in the war, despite the differences between my experience of the massacres and that of Folman, it was my war on the screen in Walsh with Bashir, but it was also his and that of the people he portrayed. Not my war, but our war. And suddenly, almost miraculously, I am not alone." Unquote. Deliberately avoiding didactic messaging, the film delivers its moral critique by its melding and molding of factual and factical memories into a powerful spectatorial experience. By its investment of spectatorial experience into the rearticulation of a historical narrative, Bashir becomes a politically creative process and makes a meaningful and important contribution to the continuous shaping of the first Lebanon war's collective memory. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, I think the, the melding of the factual and the factical um, relates very much in the film to the, to the idea of the film as a process of awakening from a dream. And the idea that basically dreams are part of the reality, or putting more accurately or slightly differently, um, you know, rem misremembering, to use a kind of a, a discourse of trauma, is part of memory itself. So the, 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 the straddling between dream and reality relates very much to something that has been discussed many times about this film. And this is the representation of traumatic events, the representation of, of the memory of traumatic events and how one remembers traumatic events differently. As I think um, um, Janet Walker says it, 
remembering remembering traumatic events is remembering with a difference. It's not re it's not really remembering something straightforwardly, but remembering something differently. So it's like remembering, but it's misremembering. And obviously, Walter Bashir straddles these, um, um, and I think in a very interesting way through the animation and the sound, straddles the boundaries between film and uh, be between um, um, reality and dream to make the case for the fact that you can never really retrieve memories unless you, you, you bridge the boundary between what is false and what is real, what, ha what actually happened and what is it that you actually remember through the way. So even if the, the final chord of the film, the awakening of what I described here, you know, the, the, the looking at the Palestinian women and the transition to um, live action footage, is not really an awakening. I don't think that Foreman admits to have, you know, the, 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 the image that he so much awaited for, the image of where he has been through the Sabra and Shatila massacre. He kind of tells us that this private recollection, this, this personal recollection is, is impossible. It's always <coughs> gonna be mediated by, 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 you know, collective memory, by collective images, images that we, that, you know, Israelis are familiar with and not just him. Um, and, I, and I think this is where I'll take your comment about um, dreams and reality to the, to the idea of memory and to the idea of trauma and how these have to, uh, you know, to uh, cross those boundaries. You got a response? Um, everything was said <laughs> by both of you, but uh, I found it interesting. Uh, the topic of collective memory and collective consciousness. Uh, it's Jung's idea. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, uh, another thing that is linked to my uh, thesis uh, was the synesthesia uh, uh -huh. part. You, you talked about synesthesia. Right. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, the uncanny uh, uh, valid hypothesis is always based on Hoffman's uh, art, who is believed to be uh, to suffer from synesthesia. Right. And he saw uh, images when uh, somebody told him figures and numbers, or, right. and the other way around. Right. Uh, heard music when he saw colors. Right. So it's an interesting link. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if I could add to you um, a question, a comment. Um, I think the dream is, dreams are always happening. Um, they are distorted. When, we, when we're asleep, they're distorted through symbolization. When we're awake, they're distorted through our senses. Mm -hmm. But it's always there. So in that sense, dreams are real. And it's just a matter of um, what access we have to it. And um, maybe what animation and dreams have in common is the symbolization, it's using the image Hmm. So, I don't know, because it's, it's, it's a distinction so often made, you know, the dreams are not real. Right, that they're part of the fictional, yeah. Right. As, and in, in a sense, maybe they still are as, as insignificant, but they are. They are a language that we cannot hear unless we, when we withdraw from the, rea the waking reality and the dream, or when we are able to read through the senses, they're right there. Yeah, and I think that's p p part of what Foreman is doing, is trying to visualize it with the animation, that is giving this ontological value to dreams as they are part of, of reality for him. They're part of what he remembers as, as the events occurred. Um, and, um, I, there's only, as, as I said in the presentation, a few um, hints in terms of animation or sound that what we see is can actually be differentiated to what actually happened and what Foreman misremembers. 
but at the same time, animation gives him the ability to fudge them together, to bring them together to a whole um, you know, sequence, just like in the motivating scene, that you actually see two events that really, there are two versions of the same event, but they're seen as one continuous event. Yeah. For me, that, that, that was the comment, you know, right, that, right. You know it, it, it also uh, factual reality, you know, this, this is about this, but actually right. it right. at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought there was a fascinating thought that previously you did with this, you know, yeah. around always, always in dreams somehow. Um, but I wonder if you could substitute the word imagination for dreams. I mean, I think this is this is a uh, this experiment that Ori Sivan is talking about very much relates uh, to, to the discussion of trauma. I mean, he's taking it later in the film to the idea of, the, of of how to depict trauma. In a way, he's providing Fulman with the with kind of the visual template of how to formalize the film, how to create the film visually and, and, and orally, um, and by by basically claiming the same validity to memories as or false memories as to um, re, you know, as to you know um, real events or how events actually happened actually occurred um, and this is why I gave the superimposition of the Ferris wheel on top of you know the scene where they talk because I think I think the film takes this experiment and internalizes it in a way through its form it becomes to be the you know the template from which to according to which to make the film. Um, yeah, and, and obviously it relates to trauma and how you remember things differently and convince yourself that the way that you remember them is the way that they happen, but actually it's, it's, it's not the case. So for the whole process of the film, at least this is what Foreman is trying to claim, he still thought, he was still convinced that he was bathing, you know, in the... In the uh, in the waters of Beirut, up until the, the the ultimate act of remembering. So this is very much relates to to that experiment, mm -hmm. and how your mind basically fills in holes of the memory. I mean, I've got a few. If there's no other questions, are there? Oh. About what? Brain and arm, and it's speculative, realist, philosophical account of the world. Because he's taking Heidegger's writing and writing about ontology. In order to try and get an account of the real, which is always in some sense receding. Uh, Harman's work is particularly interesting because he addresses some, something monstrous about, about the real. So, for example, when he writes about H.P. Lovecraft, 
right. No, that sounds extremely interesting. I'm not familiar with this work. So the, the, the reference, there is a reference specifically to animation, to how animation does that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear more about it from you. I'm not familiar with it. Did, but you, it's did you say Daniel Carter? Uh, I, I didn't, didn't hear the name. Daniel Carter? Great Palm. Great Palm. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a connection with uh, Lacan Rio? Rio with a capital R. Some of the writing, some of that, and I'm not an expert on it, but some of the writers who are associated with these people do do talk about the critical reading of the account. So it's much more, it seems to me, common to what comes out of this phenomenological, ontological account of the real account, how things always disappear. So, so an event. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll have to. So, yeah. Just to make, I guess, an observation that uh, we, what uh, we, we've been dealing with, you know, photographic reality for what 160 years or whatever, and cinema for 100 years, and uh, I think only now, in the last probably 10, 10 20 years, uh, and this is perhaps explains, or I think, sort of explains the uh, the. Uh, the, not resurgence, but the appearance or power of the animated documentary is that we're now, only now reclaiming the, uh, the graphic, many different forms of graphic expression from the cinema. The cinema has been so completely dominant that all these other ways of imagining have been uh, pushed back, almost made invisible. And, uh, and I think it's, it's really, uh, what we're seeing is a whole lot of different and say Walsh with the sheer might be a graphic novel version of the Beirut War. But I, I could imagine that someone would do it in some sort of 3D as some sort of classic uh, Hellenic, you know, story or something of, of a, a completely different approach. And someone else might do it as stick figures or whatever. And this is, you know, we have thousands of years of graphic uh, presentations of reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just think it's a process of rediscovery of our own human history, telling you know, real stories. You know, hopefully this will be just the tip of the uh, proverbial iceberg. We'll start a very long process of reclaiming reality from, from photographic cinema. Was, yeah. it, was it you, Naomi, you quite, did you quote Mamovich? Or yeah. Or was it yeah, it was you. Yeah. Saying yeah. It, yeah. It's a yeah. kind of photo indexicality. It's yeah. just a blip. Yeah, it's a, a brief yeah. 100 year kind exactly. of anomaly yeah. of indexicality yeah. in it. Does anyone have any more questions for Stefamira? I'm just aware that it's been kind of quite heavily balanced in that. I mean, because I do, I've got a question, I don't. 
the uncanny valley with a number of questions I've got. Hmm. I was, I was going to say something, just, it was just a brief comment really about the, the connection between um, the, the points about the reality of receiving and, and in wake of life, for example, there's that, you know, kind of thing where he's like, right, this is real, oh, I've woken up, it's not real. <laughs> this is real, and then, you know, he's kicking through the lake, it's like you're doing inception in a slightly yeah. different way. So, right. So is that that kind of connection between levels of reality and, um, and you, you kind of trying to grasp the reality and then keep realising that it's a dream? Um, then he speaks to the lucid dreamers and they're kind of, you know, you can control your dreams, you know, they are, like I said earlier, they're, they're a form of reality in, in their own kind of way. So, but that was more of a quick yeah. sidebar. I've got, well, there's a semi-related question, actually, which is that I thought it was interesting that in, when you're talking about the Uncanny Valley, you're talking about uh, robotics at first, and then you're talking about C CGI. And so, like, for instance, Pixar were mm -hmm. discussed. I mean, one of the things that I thought was more, you had more Uncanny Valley with Pixar with the first Toy Story when you see humans, and, and they weren't any good at animating humans. Well, they weren't, you know, it was like this rubbery plastic thing. Like, they were great at rendering the toys, but not very good at rendering them. Yeah. Um, um, I kind of wondered whether th there is a, what the relationship is between kind of a robot which you physically see in reality and, uh, and something in a, say, a Pixar movie or a, a CGI whereby you, the, the, there's an interesting kind of crossover there, I think. Yes, there is. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, I just wondered if you'd like to comment on uh, that. Yeah, I would, I would like to say that there is a specialist in cybernetics, Dario Coreano, who, who actually said that um, the uncanny valley doesn't exist. Uh, uh, and he, he believes that it exists only in Pixar movies, <laughs> uh, especially in the Teen Toy uh, Baby, which is uh, really, it was a challenge for them to make because it was the first, uh, one of the first computer-generated uh, uh, animation. And, uh, uh, and this, I mentioned a very interesting, uh, uh, David, <coughs> again, cyber specialist who, who also specializes in animatronics and worked in Disney. Uh, He actually, he, he fell in love with his girlfriend, that's what he said, uh, by tapping her on the shoulder and uh, saying, hey, would you like to, to make you a robot mother? To, <laughs> to make of you a robot mother? And she said, okay. <laughs> and uh, that's how they met. And a bizarre relationship. But, yeah, it's <laughs> very, it's, uh, there is a, an overlapping uh, yeah. there, and it's very interesting for me as an animator. I suppose uh, uh, this um, Dr. Mori, he believes that there will, uh, will come a day when robots will be so perfect that they will feel. That's, and so, uh, then the uncanny valley will disappear. <laughs> It's a strange kind of notion. I mean, I've actually got more. I'm, I'm very aware that we kind of should yeah. be wrapping up now because I've got I've, I've got a follow-up question to that. Maybe okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.